Hi there. So today I'm going to talk about a friend of mine who passed away not that long ago. Uh, if you'd like to support me or the channel, the information is in the description. Do not feel obligated. So yesterday I went to a get-together for a friend of mine who passed away in, I want to say, mid to late February. I can't remember exactly. Uh, this is a friend of mine who I'd known since about 2007. So I'll tell you a little bit of the backstory and you'll see how it all comes together. Uh, in 2003, I joined the Masonic Lodge. I became a Mason. Uh, at the time, I lived in Claremont, California. I was the youngest Mason. <laughs> I was 23, which was extremely young. And uh, because I became a Mason, I you know, instantly made all these friends, and one of the friends that I met introduced me to his other friends, and they all went to the same high school, which is a public, excuse me, a private school in Laverne called Calvary Baptist. So, the thing that I thought was interesting is, when I left high school, I had like one or two friends that I kind of talked to. Uh, this friend... I pretty much kept in contact with everybody because it was a small graduating class and they just all kept in kept their friendship going so in 2007 he introduced me to this friend who passed away and uh, we'd visit him together here and there and then I'd start visiting him myself he was a cool guy he had worked for Stater Brothers for 32 years and uh, basically, he lived in Claremont his whole life and went to the Calvary Baptist, which is uh, where I put my son in school. And the reason why I had him there is because I didn't want him to be taught certain things in the public school system. Uh, but more importantly, I wanted him to uh, keep the friends that he knew in high school, like uh, my other friend did. I wanted to have, you know, lasting friendships because I, I didn't have that. So, this specific friend is the person whose house I was at right before the accident. Uh, he died of alcoholism. He had worked at Staters for 32 years, and one day he uh, told me, you know, I'm, I'm going to quit. Sooner or later, I'm going to quit. I just can't take it. And uh, he was... He was a very sensitive man, and you couldn't, like, joke, disrespect him, because he was so sensitive, and, you know, he didn't want to do the whole comeback thing. He just, you know, he just, why, why would you say that? You know, he's just, he's just overly sensitive. So he couldn't take, uh, take it when people would pick on him at work or anything like that. So he finally snapped and decided that he couldn't go to work anymore. So after he told me that, I think it was the next day or two days later, he told me that he quit his job. And he just started drinking from the moment he woke up till basically he, when he went to sleep. And when he woke up, he would s start all over. Um, he would stop bathing. He wouldn't bathe for weeks at a time. And yeah, it was, it's a horrible thing to see somebody deteriorate. So, you know, I'd visit him a few times a week and just check on him. Uh, there'd be moments where he was very rude and, uh, you know, he'd try to pick a fight or something. And I'd say, you know, I got to go. And then as I'd be walking out, he'd say, you know, don't, don't, don't come back around here. You know, just, just stay away. And I was like, okay, all right, I understand. And a week later, I would just come back and, to check up on him. And he would be jogging out of the house and give me a hug and start crying and say he was so sorry for talking to me the way he did. That he's going through a lot and you know, having a hard time processing things. And His dad died when he was pretty young. And his uh, mom died shortly after. 
Uh, he had three older brothers that I know of. The one that he was close to died years ago. And the other two, basically, they never came around. Matter of fact, I have never met any of his family members other than an uncle. And I've known him since, like I said, 2007. So... Yeah, and that would, that would repeat itself. You know, um, like I said, I visit him a few times a week, and maybe the alcohol hit him the wrong way, or he'd get moody, and then he'd be really rude. And I would start walking out, and he'd tell me not to come back, and come back a week later, and it would repeat itself. He'd, you know, tell me he was really sorry, and so forth. So... On the day of the accident, I had stopped by, um, his uncle was living with him at the time, and his uncle would always give my son like chips or glazed donuts or things like that, so my son always had a blast, and hang out for, you know, 30 minutes, an hour or so, talk about 80s music, I'd usually have music playing on my phone, we like the same kind of music. And then I would, I would leave. Well, that day that I left, you know, which is the day that I got in the accident, um, a friend had contacted uh, my friend's uncle and let them know that I was in the accident. And that really affected, uh, that really affect, affected the, my friend that passed away. Um, which I think made him drink more and he just got more depressed because he thought that he could have done something. He could have told me to stay two minutes longer or something like that. You know, all, all the stuff that doesn't make make any sense. What ifs will kill you? And there was no way he could have known anything. But he kind of blamed himself partially for my accident. He could have done something. He could have made me stay longer or, you know told me to leave earlier or something. So, um, yeah, I miss him. And I miss my other friend, too, that uh, died basically of the same thing a year earlier. Earlier, They knew each other. And uh, they had a falling out years ago. And they never repaired it. So I figured they're both up there now. I'm sure they're over their differences and having a blast. So, uh, a friend of mine told me that they're having a get together uh, yesterday at three o'clock in Laverne, uh, in the in the downtown area. It was we're just gonna eat and just talk about him and, and hang out. So the day prior, I went through my excuse me. I went through my computer and uh, went through all the photos I have of him. Around my late 20s is when I really started just bringing my camera everywhere and just taking pictures of everything all the time. I went to bed thinking about photography. I woke up thinking about photography. So I had tons of pictures of this guy. And there was even one time where he wanted to have a photo shoot. And I said, yeah, sure. So... You know, he got all dressed up, and I photographed him with his equipment, his uh, musical equipment, excuse me. And then he had changed his outfit of clothing and just won a, a picture by his window. And, you know, they came out very, very good. And I just, I had a library full of, full of photos of this guy. So when I got to the get-together, oh, excuse me, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. So all those photos, I put them on a USB key. And I got them developed, and then I went to the Dollar Tree, and I got those uh, plastic magnetic picture frames. So I printed out, you know, many of the same photos, like five of each, and I put them in these frames, and I just passed them out um, at the get-together. I put them on the table and said, hey, grab whatever you want, they're free. So you can remember Alan. And I didn't notice, I looked uh, at the end of the table, and there was a picture of him and his dog that I had taken, but I had forgot about this photo. It was, uh, it was during that photo shoot, the only photo shoot that I actually had of him. 
Um, but I guess I didn't see it in the folder. It was just a picture of him, of him and his dog, and it had the date that he was you know, born and the date that he died. And it was such a great photo, and I'm not saying that because I took it. It was just, the picture was uh, well composed, it was sharp. You know, he looks great. This is before the alcohol really started aging him. And this is the photo. God, I hope you can see it well. So I'll get that glare off of it. But that's him. And that was his dog, Cooper, who died, I would say, about two and a half years ago. And he was pretty broken up about that, too. So we all hung out, hung out and ate and, you know, after a few hours, everybody started going home and I had to drive two and a half hours back to my house. But the reason why I'm doing this video is, you know, he's gone and all we have are memories and photographs. Um, all these pictures I took are are so important. This is all we have left of him. Uh, it blows me away that you can freeze a moment and you have it. You have this image of a frozen moment of a person, a landscape, you know, whatever. And I froze all these moments of him and I was able to give them to other people so they can, you know, not forget him. You know, it wasn't that long ago that we took pictures on film and we'd drop off the roll at CVS, Savon, Stater Brothers, whatever. My mom always used to do it at Stater Brothers. She had a 110 camera and with that little, it was like a, like a rectangle thing that you would attach to the top of the camera and there'd be like eight flashes or something like that. So you'd have to hook that up so the camera would flash if you needed a flash. And so it seemed like every time we went to Stater Brothers to get food, she'd always drop off a roll of film. Sometimes she'd have me fill out the thing and and you get a print. You know, there was no digital images back then. So you'd have this tangible thing that you could hold on to, you know, or a Polaroid. And, um, you know, these are your friends, your family, your loved ones, your favorite places, favorite landscapes, whatever. And if the friend passed away or the family member, whatever, this is all you had left. You know, it's a little different now. It's digital. You can look at your phone and see all these images. And photography is so extremely important um, to record people's lives. So you have something left. You know, imagine you have a loved one that maybe he was camera shy or he didn't let anybody take any photos. And... You just, he's gone, he passes away, and all you can do is rely on your memory. Well, that's kind of hard. I think over time you're going to forget little details. You're going to forget exactly what their chin looked like or their nose. Or Did he have blue eyes or green eyes? Yeah, you run into that sort of thing. And eventually you'd probably pretty much forget what they look like. I'm so happy that I did photography, that I do photography you know, as a hobby and that I did it as a profession. And I was able to give all these people a memory that they would have forever. You know, most people don't, I guess it doesn't really click with most people. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but like, let's say there's a woman whose husband or son passes away. And there's a group of friends, and one brings up something about, you know, her husband, and everybody's like, hey, shh. You know, like it's going to bother her. That's not the case most of the time. 90% of the time, people want to talk about their loved one. I want to talk about my son. I don't want it to be hidden. I want you to bring up my son and say, hey, remember that one time? Or, you know, or just ask me if I think about him often. Sort of things like that. I, I, I want his memory to live on. You know, and not just the images that we have of him. So, when you're out there and you have a friend who's struggling, bring up their loved one that passed away. And I think you'd be surprised at her action. People don't want to be hush-hush about that. 
So on another note, my friend basically had nobody. He had two older brothers that never came around. Like I said, I never met them. But the moment that he got sick, I don't know if he contacted his brother or what, but his brother came down and started taking care of him or, or got the nurses to come and take care of him. But <laughs> he quickly got a lawyer to come over and basically have my friend sign over everything. And shortly after my friend passed away, you know, the house was sold and he had given the car, the car to that brother who took care of him's son. But from what a friend told me, when the ashes came, his brother was saying, well, what, I don't know, what am I supposed to do with these? I, I don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with them. You know, like they didn't even want them. And my friend said, well, you know, if you don't want them, you need to let me know so I can take them. But, of course, they didn't have that issue with the house and the car, right? Money brings out the worst in people. You know, a lot of people often misquote that Bible quote, you know, for the love of money is the root of all evil. It's not the, it's not money is the root of all evil. It's the love of money is the root of all evil. I remember my friend complaining that his brothers never came by to visit him. And there was one of them, which I don't think is the one that took care of his affairs. I think it was uh, the other one that he would come by every, every so often. I want to say like every few years. And my friend would want to go to lunch and hang out with him. And basically he'd come over and hang out for 10 or 15 minutes. And, oh, okay, well, yeah, I got to go. I'll see you. And that's... <laughs> All my friend received from his his family that was left. You know, um, I think that's one of the reasons why he wanted to turn off after he quit his job. That was his social network, and when him, fellow employees are starting to treat you like shit, why, why do I want to be here? And now I don't have my work, and I don't have any. I don't have any love, essentially. Um. My friend got married basically on a whim to a woman he barely knew who needed a green card. And the reason why he did this, I know is because his friend got married and I'm sure another friend or two got married and he was getting older and you know, he's coming up on 50 and he had no kids. He had never been married. You know, what's, what's going to happen to me? You know, I don't have anybody. So he married the wrong woman. They annulled it really quickly. And he, in a way, died alone. You know? And I wonder, I already know the answer, but what if he met a woman that genuinely just cared about him? You know, wanted to be there with him and you know, you're having a problem with this alcohol. I'm going to do whatever I can to help you. And even if I can't get you to quit this, I'm going to be here and love you regardless. You know, Mark talks a lot about this unconditional love. What unconditional love does for someone. I think if he had found a woman like that, he'd still be here. You know, he'd probably learn how to work out his job. He only had like two more years and he'd be retired. He had no issues with money. He had plenty of money. His house was virtually paid off. You know, he had been living there since the, I think, the late '80s, and he died at 50, 52 or fifty-three. He was young. But yeah, all you need is love. You know, if he just had a little bit. A little more of it in his life, he wouldn't have wanted to turn off. And it broke my heart that he. <laughs> there's no reason for him to blame himself about my accident. But think about that, too, on a different level. Oh my god, so. People can be here and six minutes later get killed? 
We all know that that can happen. We say that all the time. Tomorrow's never promised. But to really fully experience that. My friend and his son were here six minutes ago. And now his son's dead. And it looks like my friend's going to die too. You know, obviously I managed to pull out, but... I mean, you never know what's going to happen. And, um... Because this friend chose to do what he did, I'm never going to see him again. Not here, at least. All I have left are pictures, and... You know, when I moved up here, I would, um... You know, I'd text him, hey man, I'm thinking about you, I hope you're alright. And sometimes he'd call me. You know, he's old school, not so much for texting, he wants to have a conversation. And we'd talk, and sometimes I'd stop by when I was down there, and the last time I stopped by, I didn't call, because I usually don't call, but whenever I stop by, usually I just stop by at people's houses. I know maybe it's bad manners, but it's just something I do, generally, not all the time, most of the time. So I stopped by his house, and he was a little disheveled, like he normally was after he quit his job. And he's like, uh, why don't you call? I was like, well, I mean, I was in an area and I just you know, wanted to see you. I want to make sure you're okay. I know you're not working or anything. And he kind of just talked to me about his house. You know, uh, part of the roof caved in on a certain part. He had a leak that he didn't take care of. Not because he didn't have the money. He had plenty of money. He just didn't take care of it. And so he was living in a garage, his garage, that was converted into a studio apartment to rent out a long time ago. He was living there. And, um, you know, he just talked about his place and, you know, being alone and, you know, gossip, you know, negativity, just, I think that's what happens a lot of the time when people start <laughs> just drinking too much. And... I was like, all right, man, well, I, I got to get going. And he's like, hey, can you go to Jack in the Box and get me a couple Jumbo Jacks real quick? I was like, yeah. So I drove to Jack in the Box, came back, I gave him his food and hung out with him for about another five minutes. And I said, hey, take care of yourself, man. Like, at least take a vitamin or something. Like, try to take care of yourself. You know, I care about you. And I tell him, you don't look that far gone. You're all right. And... um I said goodbye. He's like, hey, man, make sure you call next time. All right. I was like, all right, man, I will. And I kept in touch through the phone for a little while. And then I had heard that he'd been to the hospital a few times and they had only a few months to live. So I text him a little more often than normal. And when I was in town, I'd say, hey, man, I'm in the area. You know, I'd like to see you and you say oh well I have a caretaker coming over right now you know maybe next time and the second time I was in the area he told me hey, I'm in the area and, and he'd start talking about other stuff and he'd say alright man well I gotta go because my caretaker's coming I was like alright well you know I hope to see you soon and I never got to see him again and just like that somebody's gone One thing he would do a lot too, and this is before his uh, before he quit his job and got really bad, was he'd constantly be giving things away. And I know why he did this on a psychological level. Like he'd have an old camcorder here, man, uh, take it because I'm going to throw it away. Here, take this because I'm going to throw it away. He felt that if he was constantly organizing his house and getting rid of things he didn't need, um, that he would feel better. When in reality. What he's, uh, what he's doing, I guess subconsciously or however you want to word it, is he was trying to organize his brain and how he thought and how he dealt with stuff. So he did it with physical stuff instead, getting rid of things that he didn't use in a long time or this or that. One of the last things he gave me was a box filled of slides and a projector. 
And I asked, you know, why aren't you keeping this? Well, you know, my dad took a lot of these. It's the Rose Bowl in the 60s and random stuff from, you know, family, 60s and 70s. I was like, well, I mean, don't you want this? This is your family. He's like, no, you know, it's all old and, you know, I really don't need it. So I had them all scanned and I gave him the digital files that we could have on his computer. And he was really, really happy. Oh, this is so cool seeing all these old photos of my family. And, um, yeah, they're on a USB key, and that way he didn't have to use the old school projector and press the button and have a, you know, white screen or a, a white wall that nothing's in front of. Photography comes up once again, how important photography is. So I know it's just kind of a, a random story. I hope I didn't bore you too much. Um. Uh, my friend who died a year ago of alcoholism. Basically, he died of lockdown alcoholism. Basically, he got laid off because of COVID. And um, he was really good with money, too, just like my other friend. And he liked to go to the gym, and he liked to go to the movies, and he couldn't do those either. So now he doesn't have a job, and he can't go to the movies, which he loves, and he can't go work out, which he loves. So... What do you do? He just went to go visit friends at their house and drank, or he stayed at home, watched TV and drank, and killed his liver. Um, we saw a, a posting on Facebook that he was very sick and on his way out. We contacted, I think it was his sister who posted it. And I said, you know, we're going to come right now. Because I wanted to make sure I could see him when he's still alive. So I drove all the way to... I think it was in Arcadia. It was a hospice. And he was yellow. He was in the semi-fetal position. And he was already non-responsive. So I think they already stopped giving him food and, and water. And they were just... You know, they had the in injection of to keep him hydrated or whatever. And they were just giving him morphine and waiting for him to die. So I couldn't tell him anything. It, well, it, at least I couldn't tell him anything and have him respond. So I told him I loved him very much. I gave him a kiss on his head and I said, you know, um, if you're able to come back in spirit or something, say hello. And that was the last time I I saw him. You can't tell people what to do. Ultimately, it's their choice if they want to be here or not. I completely understand that. I really, really understand it now. You know, after being through all the trauma I've been through and constantly thinking about not wanting to be here anymore. And that's a good way to look at it, to keep yourself from not hurting yourself is... Well, look at all the people that my friend's deaths have affected. You know, that's what will happen to all your family, your friends and loved ones and all that, including the ones that disappeared um, when you're experiencing loss. So I guess that's all I have to say. I hope I didn't bore you guys all too much. Thank you very much for watching.